Um, so for the purpose of the recording, I'll just introduce myself again. Uh, I'm Chris Engel, the coordinator of the planning scheme team here at the City of Moreton Bay um, and will be your presenter today. Um, so please uh, be aware that as the focus of this um, webinar is the Better Housing uh, Amendment um, and, and what it means for our neighbourhoods across the region, we will be addressing the proposed changes at, at quite a high level. Um, unfortunately, we'll not be able to answer any questions regarding how the planning scheme applies to specific or individual properties. Um, you can separately go to the building development section of Council's website um, to find instructions on um, obtaining further advice uh, around these types of inquiries or to actually request a pre-lodgement meeting. Uh, also, thanks very much to those of you who submitted questions when you registered for the webinar. Um, the team have compiled those um, and I'll try to respond to as many as possible during the session. Um, but for those we don't make it through today, we'll address um, these with a written response, which we'll distribute by email to everyone who registered. Um, the Better Housing Amendment incorporates five key policy areas. So what I'll do is I'll answer the questions relevant to each policy area um, as they're covered. So throughout the webinar, if you do have any additional questions, you are welcome to submit them via the Q&A function. Um, but just to note, we do have a lot of content to get through in the session, so we will have to follow up our responses to the, these questions via uh, email. So firstly, the City of Moreton Bay and the project team would like to uh, respectfully acknowledge the Kabi Kabi, Jinnabara and Turbul peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways of the Moreton Bay region and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We recognise that the Moreton Bay region has always been a place of cultural, spiritual, social and economic significance to First Nations people. And we are committed to working in partnership with traditional custodians and other First Nations communities to shape a shared future that celebrates First Nations history and culture as an irreplaceable foundation of our region's collective identity. So by way of some brief background, uh, it is important to acknowledge that the Better Housing Amendment has been proposed in direct response to residents' feedback regarding issues that affect our residential neighbourhoods. Um, they've been raised through avenues such as our Morton Says surveys, customer inquiries, um, and submissions on previous community engagement activities. Throughout the preparation and operation of the current uh, MBRC planning scheme, there has been consistent feedback over a number of years on the issues being experienced. Um, and in response to public consultation on the previous tailored amendment, there were um, approximately 80 submissions um, received just purely in relation to next generation neighborhood experiences. Um, at that time, those uh, submissions were sort of outside of the scope of the proposed amendments, um, but related to matters, um, including feelings of overdevelopment in our neighborhoods and concerns over the impact um, of new development on residential amenity. Um, the community feedback that we ha have been receiving um, has certainly been heard loud and clear by our council, um, which resolved to review the outcomes being achieved in our next generation neighborhood precinct and for secondary dwellings among other issues. And it was off the back of these investigations that council then resolved to make the better housing amendment uh, in December of 2021. Uh, Council have heard and are seeking to act on this community feedback. Um, however, we do certainly understand that we are a growing city and there is a very real need for the delivery of new homes. So as such, the amendment is aiming to strike um, a balance that continues to support the supply of housing uh, whilst improving neighbourhood design and amenity outcomes. So this current public consultation stage is um, an opportunity for us to check in with the community to help inform if we've got that delicate balance right. And we certainly remain very open to all feedback um, received during this, this period. Uh, your submissions during this stage of the process will allow us to fully consider this balance before going back to the planning minister um, with, the, with the amendment. So in terms of the purpose of the proposed changes, uh, it's really um, captured in, in the sort of tagline there about delivering better housing and better neighbourhoods um, and, and responding to the residents' feedback, so feedback around matters like um, dwelling design parameters and function, uh, development density, 
uh, residential amenity and, and sort of livability generally. Uh, the approach that the project team have taken to review um, this feedback and identify key issues has included consideration of the outcomes achieved in past development applications, uh, looking at equivalent standards uh, in other planning schemes throughout the state and investigating relevant best practice urban design outcomes, uh, as well as undertaking statistical and demographic research um, to support uh, the investigations. So the proposed amendment um, does include a really broad range of policy responses um, to enable council to better address residents' um, feedback. This includes proposed changes to encourage the delivery of things like um, lot sizes that can accommodate backyards for outdoor living, uh, appropriate setbacks and site coverage to avoid um, overcrowded neighbourhoods uh, and loss of privacy, sunlight and breezes, uh, more diverse housing types in sort of well-chosen locations that offer affordable lifestyles and more greenery like open areas, trees and landscaping so that our neighbourhoods look and feel good uh, and are cooler. Uh, and also better parking requirements to accommodate cars on site and, and less on our streets. So the first policy area um, that we will um, get into uh, is the uh, next generation neighborhood precinct or the, or the next gen precinct. Um, so the next gen precinct uh, was established when the MBRC planning scheme commenced in 2016. Um, and it, it is intended to provide the greatest mix of dwelling types to support densities um, moderately higher than our traditional sub suburban areas. Um, housing forms uh, in next gen, um, next gen precincts uh, include detached dwellings sort of on a variety of lot sizes, a greater range of attached dwellings and um, low to medium rise apartment buildings. Um, and, but importantly, the next gen precincts are those areas with convenient access to centres, community facilities and higher frequency public transport. Uh, key issues for uh, our next gen neighbourhoods that, that we've identified through community feedback and our officer investigations um, relate to sort of the higher order strategic issues around um, clarity of policy. Um, and then a number of planning and design issues relating to sort of lot size and housing diversity, site cover and setbacks, um, design, diversity and quality, and the um, lack of tree planning and open space provision in these areas. The impacts that have been observed um, and, in, and inform the policy changes include an appearance and feeling of overdevelopment, uh, a lack of open space, a lack of trees, including street trees and, and in yards, and a changing neighbourhood character and feel. In response to the uh, key issues and impacts that have been identified, a number of specific policy directions have been developed. Uh, these form the basis for the detailed proposed changes uh, in relation to um, next generation neighbourhoods um, and include encouraging housing diversity and affordability. Um, so a more cl clear and consistent policy around that. Um, and also increased mix of dwelling types and affordable options to support our, our changing population. Um, supporting walkable and well-serviced neighbourhoods, so more people living in walkable catchments or train stations and centres, uh, and getting the housing mix and density focused in those catchments. And also supporting design quality, amenity and livability. Um, so looking for uh, improvements around built form variety and interest, um, encouraging more green space to reduce um, the uh, perception of overdevelopment and, and sensitively integrate um, our next gen areas um, in, um, in sort of those transitional precincts to sort of lower intensity rural, rural residential areas. So I'm, I'm just now going to take you through some of the key proposed changes relating to our next generation neighbourhoods. Um, so firstly, the amendment focuses on getting housing mix and density in the right places, as I said. Um, it's encouraging new housing inside that 800 metre walking distance catchment of train stations and higher order and district centres. Um, and so within that catchment, that, that sort of 800 metre um, walking distance catchment, we are proposing changes which include removing um, the existing uh, maximum density of 75 dwellings per hectare in favour of, of having no maximum density there. So really encouraging those higher density forms in those areas. 
uh, removing the existing complicated requirements that seek to limit available sites and disperse dual occupancy development. So instead, dual occupancies will be encouraged um, without being limited to particular sites and lot dimensions, um, and then removing the existing minimum lot dimensions and pres prescriptive lot type mix requirements for new subdivision layouts. So the intention there being to allow more flexibility to accommodate um, different dwelling uh, forms such as terrace dwellings um, on a variety of lot sizes uh, up to 9.5 metres wide. So whereas our current ter terrace dwelling product is currently um, limited to lots up to 7.5 metres wide. The amendment uh, also looks at encouraging neighbourhoods with more green. So more open space, more trees and more landscaping. So to do this, the um, proposed changes encourage um, subdivision layouts with more attractive streetscapes. So new street trees, increased breaks between um, groupings of, of narrow lots. Um, so um, the, the breaks may um, take the form of, of larger lot types, laneways or mid block pedestrian connections to break up those long runs of, of narrow lots. Uh, townhouse and unit development also have uh, new on-site communal open space requirements where there's 10 or more units proposed, um, have increased fund setbacks and stronger outcomes for deep tree planting um, to get that, that green back in our neighbourhoods. Uh, there are also new requirements for increased verge space um, for tree planting to encourage tree planting in, in laneways in development. Um, so the proposed changes also seek to resolve the impacts of overdevelopment from dwelling houses on small lots. Um, so to achieve this, the amendment proposes requirements for um, dwelling houses with increased rear setbacks. So the intention being to provide backyards for recreation and open space amenity. Um, the proposed changes also include reduced site cover um, down to 60% for dwelling houses on smaller lot sizes um, of 400 square metres or less, um, whereas the current planning scheme allows up to 75 square metres. So again, tackling that, that feeling of overdevelopment. Um, the Queensland Development Code side setback standards are also proposed to be varied to support dwellings with eaves uh, for shade and weather protection over our setback spaces. Um, and increased site cover is being supported for terrace dwellings on lots of 300 square metres or less um, and build up to both side boundaries. Um, so long as those, those um, developments are provided with rear laneway access. And the last of our key changes relating to, uh, relates to ensuring neighbourhoods are sensitively integrated with our existing communities. So there will be, um, you'll see new requirements proposed to provide transitions between existing communities and, and uh, in the rural and rural residential zone and the new development occurring uh, in the next-gen precinct or in the, in the neighbouring areas. Um, the requirements to achieve this include um, encouraging parks and open space areas being located at the interface of these zones, um, encouraging tree-lined perimeter roads to separate different, the different zones um, with, the, with planted uh, road verges and um, larger lot sizes to transition that development intensity at the interface of those zones. Um, questions uh, that have come up in relation to uh, next generation neighbourhoods. So we've had a question um, from um, one of our registered, registered attendees today, um, which is, uh, I couldn't see where the missing middle housing was included in the plan. Uh, can you let me know uh, which sections I should look at? So firstly, in response uh, to this question, just wanting to note that the terminology uh, around missing middle is proposed to change um, to um, gentle density in the state government's draft shaping SEQ um, 2023 update. So this is, a, this is a new draft regional plan for Southeast Queensland. Um, the draft regional plan update is currently on its own separate public consultation period and, and um, it, it actually overlaps with our public consultation on the Better Housing Amendment. So it is important to note that the regional plan is, is state government policy that applies across all Southeast Queensland local government areas um, and is separate to our Better Housing Amendment. Um, you can find out uh, more and make a submission on the state government's website if you are interested in the regional plan. Uh, missing middle housing that is, that's described in the current um, Southeast Queensland regional plan uh, includes housing types that are sort of typically defined as a dwelling house, um, dual occupancy, multiple dwellings, for example, 
and the um, regional plan sets out that missing middle housing can include sort of many different detached, at attached or semi-detached um, dwellings. So forms such as terrace houses, townhouses, apartments, um, and including apartments in, in building heights between one to three stories or up to, uh, up to six stories. So our next generation neighbourhoods um, are already supporting missing middle housing types, including um, terrace dwelling houses, dual occupancy, and multiple dwellings with building heights sort of predominantly up to 8.5 metres, so that one to two storey mark, um, and up to 12 metres or higher in, in some specific locations. Our, our proposed amendment seeks to make it easier to develop missing middle housing types in these well service locations, so areas close to public transport and centres uh, with employment and services. For the um, separate regional plan update consultation, uh, you can find out more and make submissions at the state's project webpage, um, as I said earlier, um, which is just available there on the slide um, for you. So the next policy area with proposed changes uh, included in the Better Housing Amendment is, is our secondary dwellings. So secondary dwellings are, are smaller dwellings that can be built on a lot um, in conjunction with another dwelling on that same lot. So the example being the sort of traditional granny flat style of development. They can be attached to other dwellings or, or also can be obviously freestanding. Key issues um, from a community feedback and officer investigations have focused on concerns about the quality, scale and intensity of our secondary dwelling development happening in the region. Uh, and our review has confirmed that there is a, a lack of clarity about what exactly is a secondary dwelling and how they should operate. Our reviews also confirm that overdevelopment and associated undesirable development outcomes are occurring, um, including things like cars being parked on frontages and verges uh, and increased numbers uh, and in increased numbers on neighbourhood streets, increased density and changed neighbourhood character, uh, reduced open space and landscaping and um, privacy impacts where those secondary dwellings are uh, located um, close, close to boundaries. There are also, um, we've also found that there are adverse privacy and amenity impacts to immediate, immediate neighbours, um, which are being caused by the siting design of, the, of those freestanding secondary dwellings. Uh, and uh, also observed um, some undesirable car parking outcomes, which are, are impacting the character and, and, and the residential amenity of our neighbourhoods. Uh, in response to the sort of key issues and, and impacts and, and the feedback we've been receiving, there are a number of specific policy directions that have been developed uh, for secondary dwellings, that, which the, they're forming the basis of our proposed detailed proposed changes. So these include um, improving how a secondary dwelling operates. Um, so making the differences between a secondary dwelling and, and dual occupancy very clear um, that they are not one in the same. Uh, resolving small lot overdevelopment. So limiting development to large lots that are capable of accommodating both the primary and secondary dwelling and, and the services um, and improving streetscapes and managing our privacy and amenity concerns. So better design, siding and orientation um, to avoid uh, the impacts on the neighbours uh, and also maintaining that, that shared open space or, um, and parking. Um, an important clarification uh, is to make at this point is that the policy changes relating to secondary dwellings um, that are proposed in the Better Housing Amendment apply to our general residential zones. So um, the urban neighbourhood precinct, the next generation neighbourhood precinct, suburban neighbourhood precinct and our coastal communities precinct um, and also apply in the emerging community zones transition precinct um, for developed lots. It, however, the proposed changes um, do not apply uh, to secondary dwellings being proposed in the rural and rural res residential zones. Um, so there's been, uh, been a, um, a number of questions around that. So, so they um, our changes do not apply in those, those particular zones. So I'm now just going to take you through some of the key proposed changes relating to secondary dwellings uh, and the intent behind those changes. So firstly, the proposed amendment improves how a secondary dwelling operates uh, by changing the planning scheme definition to the new state legislative definition, which encourages them to be rented uh, to anyone. 
uh, requiring shared services for water, wastewater, electricity, and the like, um, and ensuring all on-site occupants can easily access open space and parking. The amendment also seeks to better manage overdevelopment impacts. Um, does this by proposing minimum lot sizes for a secondary dwelling of 450 square metres in, in the next generation neighbourhood precinct um, and 600 square metres in our suburban neighbourhood precinct. So below these lot sizes, a, a secondary dwelling um, would not be encouraged. The pro proposed amendment also manages um, scale and intensity um, by maintaining the existing secondary dwelling um, gross floor area limits or GFA limits, um, but making changes to those limits um, to link them to lot size. Um, the GFA for a secondary dwelling is proposed to be, or sort of gross floor area for a secondary dwelling is proposed to be uh, 45 square metres on lots between 450 square metres and 800 square metres, and 55 square metres on lots that are greater than 800 square metres. And again, importantly, it, this um, does not relate to secondary dwellings being proposed in our rural and rural residential areas. Uh, the amendment also proposes changes to improve amenity and privacy outcomes. So it does this by orientating any secondary dwellings, um, entry, patio, balcony or deck inwardly uh, and not towards the boundary and retaining existing 10 metre separation distance requirements between the, the primary and secondary dwelling. Uh, finally, the proposed changes seek to improve local streetscapes uh, by increasing parking for dwelling houses in the next generation neighbourhood precinct from one space to two, um, keeping the additional one car parking space requirement for a secondary dwelling. On-site open space and parking is also um, intended to be accessible to all occupants of both the primary and secondary dwelling. Um, so including some, cl some proposed clarifications around that. Uh, questions on secondary dwellings. Uh, we've had a, a question come through um, from one of our registered attendees today. Um, so what are the new rules surrounding secondary dwellings and what's council's attitude towards secondary dwellings in the current environment? Um, so we've talked a bit about the new rules through, through those previous slides, um, but the amendment does propose to improve our planning policy regarding secondary dwellings um, in, in order to support those, those improved development outcomes. So as covered in the previous slide, that's um, things like new minimum lot sizes for a secondary dwelling, um, linking our maximum GFA requirements to lot size, um, and for standalone secondary dwellings in our established neighbourhoods, um, ensuring that the primary entry um, patios, balconies and decks all, all face inwardly. Uh, Council certainly remains uh, supportive of secondary dwelling development as a means of maintaining choice and diversity in housing and as a means of achieving um, or contributing to our long-term growth management goals. But through the amendment, we are seeking to ensure that form of development um, doesn't occur at the, at the expense of appropriate amenity and character outcomes with our region, regions, residential neighbourhoods. And, and so again, directly responding to community feedback around those matters. So for our off-street car parking ratios, um, so the is again in response to uh, um, significant concerns raised by residents, or um, and feedback over over time about sort of um, about adverse car parking issues in our in our residential neighbourhoods. So the the better housing amendment um, includes proposed changes to our off-street car parking ratios, specifically um, around a number of um, particular land use types, um, being multiple dwellings, student accommodation, dual occupancy, and dwelling houses. Uh, the car parking ratio changes also focus on um, the localities uh, included in the next generation neighborhood precinct and our, and our urban neighborhood precinct. Some of the key issues and community feedback um, from, and from uh, and officer investigations have focused on concerns about character and amenity um, and adverse local neighbourhood road network impacts. Um, our review has confirmed that there, are, there were a number of issues, including um, the fact that existing ratios don't meet resident and visitor demand. Um, the City of Morton Bay 
parking ratios are, are also have also been found to be quite low when compared to other southeast Queensland councils. So for multiple dwellings and student accommodation, um, the ratios uh, don't reflect a variation in parking due to the number of bedrooms or the number of on-site students or student beds. Uh, there's also um, no requirement for visitor parking for multiple dwelling development currently. Uh, and poor um, or undesirable parking outcomes um, were observed and, and, and observed to be causing adverse character and neighbourhood amenity impacts. So in response to the, the, all of these issues uh, and impacts, a specific uh, policy direction has been developed, um, which forms the basis of our, our detailed proposed changes um, in relation to our off-street car parking ratios. Um, this is that new policy is focused on resolving insufficient car parking issues um, and making sure there'll be enough on-site car parks for both residents and visitors. So I'm just going to take you now through some of the key proposed changes relating to off-street car parking ratios um, and the intent behind, behind those changes. So for multiple dwellings, um, current ratios um, don't adequately reflect demand and don't differentiate for locations outside of, but close to a centre or public transport. Um, we've also found that other Southeast Queensland ratios have um, been based on a sliding scale that increases with the number of bedrooms per dwelling. So the amendment proposes to align ratios with those of Sunshine Coast and Gold Coast councils, as you'll see on screen there, um, ranging from one space per one bedroom dwelling um, through to two spaces per four bedroom dwelling. Uh, and importantly, also establish a visitor car parking requirement, which is, which is currently missing. Uh, for student accommodation, uh, the current ratio um, has been identified as an anomaly um, it, as it is based on dwellings and not numbers of students or student beds. So this is actually resulting in a significant undersupply of car parking. Um, the amendment around student accommodation proposes to align ratios with those of Sunshine Coast Council to require one space per two beds um, and also establish a staff member car parking requirement. Uh, for dual occupancy and dwelling house development, the current ratios uh, in, in our planning scheme are outliers when they're compared to other Southeast Queensland councils. Um, other councils uh, commonly align with the Queensland Development Code or QDC being sort of the statewide policy basis for these development types. So the amendment uh, as it relates to occupancy and dwelling houses proposes to align ratios with those of the QDC, QDC at two spaces per dwelling. Um, the adjusted ratio is uh, considered appropriate as an interim measure in response to our current um, city context. In terms of questions uh, relating to our off-street car parking ratio changes, and um, we've had a, a number. Um, the first one um, there is uh, what changes are being made to parking minimums? Parking minimums hurt small businesses by meaning they need more land than is often necessary. Um, so just to clarify in relation to that question, the amendment's not proposing to adjust or alter parking minimums associated with small business or commercial orientated development activity. Um, instead, uh, in response to the concerns raised by residents um, about sort of um, undesirable parking issues in our residential neighborhoods, the scope of the amendment is focusing on interim adjustments to um, our parking policy uh, and, and off-street park parking ratios um, for a limited number of residential activities as, to, as I outlined earlier. So those are, uh, again, multiple dwellings, student accommodation, um, dual occupancy and, and dwelling houses. The next question we've had on, on our off-street car parking ratios um, is uh, how are alternative transport methods being added to the planning changes? Large developments cannot be allowed to only support cars and large vehicle access. Bikes, buses, and trains should be considered as well. So just uh, in order to sort of uh, consider current and future demand and to look at things like access to public transport and, and alternative transport methods, um, Council has recently commenced um, a more comprehensive off-street car parking study 
um, the studies focused on ensuring that the research justification and, and, and the recommendations out of that process are sort of tailored to our specific circumstances. Um, but while the study is underway, the, the Better Housing Amendment um, has incorporated sort of targeted and, and, and tailored car parking ratio adjustments as a as more of an interim measure. Um, so, it, and, and really that's in order to respond to residents' concerns and address those um, undesirable impacts that, that have arisen in our region's residential neighbourhoods relating to, to car parking. Um, and then the final question there um, relates to, um, is up on, on slide there, given that other jurisdictions are removing uh, minimum parking requirements and the uh, Southeast Regional Queensland plan, I'm, I'm assuming, is looking to set targets for maximum parking requirements. Uh, what was the rationale behind increasing the minimum parking requirements uh, for next-gen developments? Uh, so in response to, to that question, the, the rationale for the proposed changes really um, does stem from uh, residents' um, feedback and, and issues uh, um, raised over time about those um, sort of undesirable parking um, outcomes that are occurring in our neighbourhood. So that's really prompted Council's review. Um, the review has identified that current parking policy um, for our off-street car parking ratios for those, those uses um, that we've discussed is, is resulting in a parking undersupply and, and that's in turn causing adverse amenity and, and local road network impacts for um, residents and visitors to these areas. So in particular, um, Council's parking uh, ratios for dual, dual occupancy and dwelling house development in our next generation neighbourhood police precinct and the transition precinct to the emerging community zone are outliers when compared to other Southeast Queensland councils. Um, and as I, as I said earlier, it's, it's common for, for um, councils to be aligning with the, the QDC being that, that policy basis, um, which requires two spaces per dwelling instead of the, the current one space. Uh, just moving on then to the next policy area. Um, so a review was also carried out to better understand the impacts um, student accommodation development was having in our residential neighbourhoods and um, the development outcomes that were being achieved. Uh, in response to the, the review, um, the Better Housing Amendment also includes a number of proposed changes relating to student accommodation. So key issues from community feedback and officer investigations have focused on concerns about increased density, um, and corresponding amenity and character uh, impacts. Um, our review has identified issues with uh, the density or development intensity of um, student accommodation development, uh, which is affected by the number of on-site students. Um, it puts pressure on site cover and setbacks um, and is causing those, those neighborhood character and amenity impacts. Uh, issues were also identified with open space and, and landscaping, um, which um, it is having the potential for adverse impacts, especially when it comes to the, the immediate neighbours. Uh, design and appearance issues were also identified, um, noting that um, for student accommodation development, this, this can impact the integration of this type of development, uh, especially if um, the, the buildings are bulky or, or, or box-like um, and certainly can be at a scale with adjoining residential buildings. Uh, and finally, there were um, on-site parking issues, which were also identified um, that we've covered in the previous section around our off-street um, car parking ratios. So in response to these key issues and impacts, uh, specific policy directions have been developed. They form the basis for the detailed proposed changes in relation to student accommodation development. Uh, the proposed changes support improved outcomes in relation to our, the building design elements, form and functionality of open space areas, amenity, uh, especially for those neighbours, and um, on-site car parking. For uh, student accommodation, uh, one of the common questions we've been hearing is, is why is density an issue for student accommodation developments? Um, as I said earlier, the, the surrounding areas um, to these developments are affected by the number of people, so students or visitors accessing and using the sites, um, and the undesirable outcomes in relation to density um, do contribute to that perception of, of overdevelopment. 
So it also um, increases the potential for noise and, and adverse amenity impacts, especially for those neighbours. Um, so in response, um, the Better Housing Amendment is proposing to sort of recalibrate the density requirements for student accommodation um, with a new measure that's actually based on student beds per hectare. Um, the next policy area covered uh, relates to the Warner investigation area. So the, the Better Housing Amendment also includes proposed changes to the Warner investigation area boundary um, in response to prior community consultation uh, for that area. It is proposed to amend the Warner investigation area boundary um, in accordance with the outcomes and commitments made to the community in 2017 um, through previous um, structure planning and, and community engagement uh, for that area. Um, the reduced boundary that is proposed will ensure better protection and retention of existing character and amenity of the rural residential lots south of Conflagration Creek and south of Warner and Cooperoo Roads. Um, and it will also ensure better protection of the environmental values uh, near the western boundary um, that you'll see on the slide there. So this does include matters of, of, of state environmental significance. Uh, for consistency, it's also proposed to amend um, references in the planning scheme strategic framework. Um, in terms of questions relating to the proposed changes for the Warner investigation area boundary, um, we, we are getting a number of questions around what impact um, will the proposed Warner investigation area boundary um, changes have on development area in development in the area. So it's probably important to note that there are no um, zoning changes proposed for land in that balance area. Uh, extensive development approvals are, are already in place um, and, and do reflect the negotiated outcomes um, over the course of uh, the various development applications being uh, assessed. Um, south of Conflagration Creek and south of Warner and Cooperoo Roads, um, the rural residential development will be retained. And, and again, the zoning is not proposed to change in those areas. Um, the, the changes really seek to respond to um, the environmental values um, and protect significant vegetation, um, it, particularly in the west, that, which includes, um, includes Mount Koala habitat. Um, so the proposed change to the boundaries is really about addressing community expectations for the area and also to clarify council's position on future development opportunity uh, in that area. Um, the Better Housing Amendment is also supported by accompanying proposed changes to a number of the planning scheme policies. Um, so planning scheme policies support the operation of the planning scheme by providing guidance, standards and specifications referenced by the scheme. Uh, and whilst our um, proposed changes to the planning scheme policies align with the Better Housing Amendment under our, um, our state planning legislation, a separate amendment process is required. So that's why um, you'll also see the planning scheme policies amendment no, number two being proposed and, and running um, our public consultation period on those proposed changes um, concurrent to the Better Housing Amendment. The PSPs for neighbourhood design, residential design and integrated design uh, require changes in support of the Better Housing Amendment. Um, so those changes are, are about aligning the two. Um, changes to the PSP or the planning scheme policy for township character are also proposed um, to better reflect and support the unique township character of um, our rural townships of Diagula, Dabra, Sanford Village, Wamuran and, and Woodford. So the proposed uh, amendment includes updated um, township character descriptions and imagery, um, which was the intention being to guide future development in those, in those townships. Uh, importantly, um, we are smack bang in the middle of our public consultation period. Um, so in terms of uh, making a submission, um, we the public consultation period runs through to Monday the 4th of September. Um, submissions can come through um, certainly uh, online um, and in the other uh, via the other methods uh, noted on the slide there. So via email, postal, or actually in person. Um, but I, I guess it is really in, important to note that all types of feedback um, are encouraged and, and particularly including positive feedback if you are in support 
Um, there's also a quick poll function on the Your Say Morton Bay webpage, um, which will allow you to express your views on some of the, the key policy areas uh, um, as well. Um, your input at this really, really important stage of the process is um, pivotal in helping inform council's recommendations um, on the amendment for the um, next step of, of it um, going back to the, the planning minister. Uh, so where to from here? Um, when the public consultation period closes on the 4th of September, um, council will be reviewing all of the submissions that we've received uh, and consider sort of what response is required to those submissions. So this might include making uh, any adjustments to the proposed amendment if, if necessary. Um, if the uh, necessary adjustments are significant, it's, it is worth noting that a further round of community consultation would need to be undertaken. Um, Following council endorsement um, of the amendment, the planning minister then undertakes final consideration of the proposed amendment um, and advises council if the amendment may be adopted. So that might be with or without conditions. Um, from there, the proposed changes to the planning scheme um, will take effect um, following council making a resolution to adopt the proposed amendment and set a commencement date. Um, so that concludes today's uh, webinar session on the Better Housing Amendment. Um, I do um, sincerely thank you for taking the time to attend. Um, if you have any further questions, I'd certainly encourage you to visit the Your Say Morton Bay Project webpage for the amendment um, or get in contact via phone or email. Um, and if you do um, want to find out any further information about any of the policy areas we've discussed today, um, the uh, there are a number of policy directions papers for each of those policy areas that are on the Your Say Morton Bay page, and they're a really great place to start to find um, some further information. Um, so thank you again, um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to receiving uh, your submissions should you choose to um, provide one, and certainly open to um, answering any questions you might have throughout the process. Thanks. <laughs>